Well, good morning. Please pass your cards inside out. It'll be picked up at this time. This Lord's Day morning, I want to be discussing, is there any hope for me? Now, I don't want you all to pass judgment. That's not asked particularly for you to judge me. That's for all of us. Everybody understand? No, I mean, do you understand? Man, uh, let me get to some place I want to get to before we begin, because I want to tell you that story without you having to read that story. Yeah. You're a fast reader already up with me, aren't you? Boy, I tell you, that's, those are some good slides right there, right here. Uh, as a gospel, by the way, it's good to have Randy and Sharon with us. Love you guys. Great work you're doing. Keep on doing that, okay? Use my sermons over there. I'll have great effect. <laughs> anyway, as a gospel preacher, you get to hear a lot of things. Some things are fantastic. Some things are not so fantastic. But uh, I can promise all of you, and you know me well enough, after almost on August, excuse me, October the 2nd, I will have been here 29 years And you know me well enough that what you tell me in confidence, I take to the grave with me. Um, My wife doesn't know. My kids don't know. My best friends don't know. But if the money's right, I'll... No, I'm just teasing. But you hear a lot of things. I'm reminded of a a time, and I'd never seen this gentleman before. haven't seen him since. But I'm at an athletic event. And, uh, you know, watching a game and uh, talking to a friend. And someone he knew walked up to us, and uh, like I said, I'd never met him before. And he started telling, you know, the, the friends some things and all of this. Then I was introduced. He found out I was a preacher. He looked at me and he said, would you mind if I take a few minutes of your time and talk to you about something that's really heavy on my heart? Well, you don't turn that down. I said, well, of course. So we walked to a place that was secluded. And he started telling me things atrocious things, ugly things that he had been involved in doing in the past and was doing some of it still today. And I, I tell you, whenever he's telling me these things, they were so gross and ugly, I thought to myself, you may be putting my, myself and my family in danger. I kept thinking, boy, blue lights are going to start flashing. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to prison. Here you go. All, I mean, awful things. And with tears in his eyes, he looked at me and he said, do you think there's any hope for me as far as God's concerned? And I was thinking fast as he's telling me all these things, because really I was, very few things shocked me after being a minister for 38 years, but things he happened to be saying were shocking. And I looked at him, he said, is there any hope for me as far as God's concerned? I said, sir, the answer to that question is yes and no. He was puzzled. He looked at me and he said, what do you mean, yes or no? I guess he thought it was a rhetorical thing. He was asking, needed no response. Of course, there's hope for him. But I said, let me ask you a question. Do you think there's any hope of my going home tonight and being with the family I love, with my wife and my children? He said, well, I sure hope so. And I said, well, I want you to understand something. My house is where my security is. My house is where I find love like I know nowhere else on this earth. My house is where my safety is. It is unmovable. It is steadfast. But you know it doesn't come to me. I have to go to it. So yes, if you're asking me, is there hope for me? Yes, there's hope for you. If you go toward God... And are obedient to his word. If you don't, it's like anything else. There is no hope for anyone, myself included, if I walk away from God and stay away from God. I wonder how it's gotten to the point that 2,000 years after the death of our Lord and Savior, there are those who are still asking the question, is there hope? You know, obviously, there are those individuals who have either given up or have never taken the time to look in God's Word in the first place. It's crammed full 
of examples about hope and love and God being on our side. That God wants all people to repent. He doesn't want any to perish. Remember reading that? That our God is a, a loving God. That's the reason that Jesus Christ was sent to this earth. But there are a lot of people that are just given up or they don't ever want to look in the Word of God in the first place. Look at Galatians 6, 7, and 9. ESV says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. I love that scripture, don't you? God is not mocked. You can be scornful towards God. You can shake your fist towards God. You can be angry towards God. All of these things that you think might be beneficial to you. I remember hearing one actor say when it's about God says, says uh, my, my example to people about God is just to hate him. It works for me. And I thought to myself, are you kidding me? God's word says God will not be mocked. Literally meaning he has the last word, church. Is there any hope for us? Well, watch. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Because all of us here are sowing something. Amen. Verse 9. And let us not grow weary of doing good. You know what that's talking about? I've told you before many times. I've heard many Christians say, I am so tired of being good. And usually it's with reference to being at work. When, uh, you know... Uh, they have somebody saying something ugly to them or something doesn't suit their fancy and they want to speak up and talk out and do all of this. And then they, they realize and you know, they hold it in and, and hold it in. They feel like they really need to let somebody know what's really on their mind. And then they talk to me about, you know, example and about this and what would I suggest and all of that. And I've told you many, many times that married, married couples come to me and they're so angry. I mean, they're just frustrated with each other. And I, I tell them quite often, I say, well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home and, sir, I want you to write down every complaint against your wife that you can think about. Everything negative about her that gets on your nerves, that bothers you. I want you to write it down and bring it to the office next time. Ma'am, I want you to do the same thing. And I mean, I've had anything from a, a, you know, two or three things written on a page to half a dozen pages filled with stuff. And they hand it to me. And I ask them, do you people love each other? And it's a baited question, I'll admit. Yes, we love each other. Well, let me tell you what that means. And I take the list and I tear it up don't even look at it, throw it in the trash. And I turn to 1 Corinthians 13 and I says, love keeps no record of wrong. In 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 8, we're going to see it in a little bit, love never fails. So if you love each other, why are you tearing each other apart? Here we get to this part of Scripture. Let us not grow weary of doing good. Why is it that you may want to tear the Word of God apart? For your benefit. Why is it? That's saying, don't grow tired of, of being a child of God. Don't go back into the world. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. There is hope. But it all depends on what you're sowing. I didn't tell the person anything that the Bible doesn't say. Now watch this. Many can't see their blessings because the world is in the way. Hello, church. Truer words were never spoken. Many can't see their blessings because the world is in the way. Watch this. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 4. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Okay, don't grow weary, don't lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. Watch this carefully. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. Boy, I love that. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In, the, in their case, the God of this world, Satan, I believe, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them 
from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So let me tell you something. There are some people out there who are never going to see the truth. Not because they're unable, but because of where they are in their life, and they refuse to change. I believe this scripture is teaching us, these scriptures are teaching us, that no one's going to go to heaven who isn't serious about Christian living. Who isn't serious about the death of Jesus. You can't tell me one person ever in the history of mankind that accidentally is going to heaven. It's not going to happen. So when I tell this man right in the middle of of an atrocious lifestyle that the answer to your question about hope is yes and no, I was telling him exactly what the Word of God has to say. Can you imagine hoping you can escape a certain catastrophe, but you keep going toward it? Can you imagine that? Vicki and I, uh, living in Malvern back in, I guess it was 82, 83, 82, to, I think when the, the tornado came through there, and I've told you that story many, many times, about uh, uh, Karen being down at the uh, Taekwondo school, and I'm at the house, and knew it got dark, and I, but where we were on that side of town, nothing happened. It came on the, uh, I, I'd gotten, uh, taken a shower, and uh, uh, you know, worked out, taking a shower, supposed to go that back down there, and I think we had some things supposed to do with church folk that evening, supposed to go pick up Karen and all of this. Vicky was getting, getting supper ready, and it came across the television, Tornado Hits Malvern. I looked outside, and I thought, hmm. And it said, uh, you know, on that side of town where Karen was, picked up the phone, phone didn't work. And I'm thinking to myself, self, I've got to get to my daughter. So I drove as far downtown as I could. As far downtown as I could. And it was, I I left the house about 6 o'clock. And Vicki and Christy are at home. And I'm telling you, I got over by the schoolhouse. Which, uh, because of the, the damage, it's the only place I could get to. By the schoolhouse to where Walmart Place was, where she was, about a mile, maybe a mile and a half away, as Jack Smith walked. So there I am, I get out, I'm going in neighborhoods that I've known for eight years now, I didn't recognize. A policeman stopped me and told me, he said, sir, you can't go, I knew him, he said, you can't go this way, he's one of my Taekwondo students, he said, you can't go this way. I said, I love you, but I'm going through you or around you, one of the two. I've got to get to my daughter. I'm saying that in Christian love. He looked at me and stepped aside and smiled. I'd do the same things, what he said. So I walked through there. I got all the way to where she was at the Taekwondo Center. All the way where she was. And got her home by 10 o'clock. Vicky's crying. Everybody's crying. Christy looked at me and she said, Dad, I I, I learned how to blow a bubble. I'm thinking to myself, oh, wow. But here's the secret to that story. When I got there, the tornado had made a swath right down. The the mall there was down on a little hill, you know, Pizza Hut here, little hill. Over here on this side is where the Taekwondo school was. And up here was a car lot on top of this hill before it went down in that little dip. And the tornado had gone right by that that, uh, car lot but hadn't touched where Walmart Shopping Center was or where the Taekwondo School was. From 6 o'clock to 10 o'clock, four hours, church, I headed to where the catastrophe was. I walked through that catastrophe. And if I had common sense, or had known, I guess I should say, if I'd have gone out from where I lived, made a left, got on the freeway, went down Old Military Highway, I could have driven to her in 15 minutes to have her home. I headed toward the, I wasn't in it, but I'll guarantee you I was down that place where all this catastrophe was happening and people were scattered everywhere, people crying, people, I'll guarantee you no one wanted to be in that catastrophe. About a week later, we're supposed to go out to this uh, uh, friend's house. We got in a car, drove, uh, started on the, (laughs) started going towards, oh, what's that big metropolis, Magnet Cove? Yeah, 
Magnet Cove, started that way and a tornado was coming right down toward us. Number two in a week. I turned around and got away from that tornado. I know you're not, anyway, the point of that is, you're not gonna turn your life around by going toward catastrophe after catastrophe. And we know that in logic, but boy, putting it into practice is something else. Some of the most fascinating things about love are found in 1 Corinthians 13, 7 through 8a. Love bears all things, believes all things, watch, hopes all things. Now this is interesting. Believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Now here's what's fascinating about that to me. This is not only true about God and how God loves us, but also about how we are to love Him and to love one another. You see, this type of hope is not the type of hope where you're wishing something's going to happen in your life. It is the type of hope, Hebrews 11, 1, I'll get to that in a little bit too. It's the type of hope that believes it's absolutely going to happen and you have no doubt. Love hopes all things. Well, what does it mean? It comes to the Word of God. If God says it, Titus 1 and verse 2 says, God cannot lie. If the Word of God tells me, if I hear the gospel, if I believe it, if I repent of my sins, seriously repent of my sins, Luke 13 and verse 3, and turn around and go toward God and live with God and put those sins behind me, understanding it's not a one-time deal, it's a continual action. That's what repentance is. Not that I'm never going to fail again, but my heart is where it is, and I'm living for God each and every day I can, First John 1 and verse 7, with all my might and all my strength, that that kind of hope believes all things are possible with God because God is not a liar and His promises are precious. And I cling to those things. And God tells me, not only can I have salvation, I can know I have it, 1 John 5 and verse 13. So this is just a beautiful part of Scripture. Notice especially that love hopes all things. Romans 5 and verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who, ha he, yeah, who has been given to us. So the Word of God's telling us, don't be afraid to have positive hope. God said, this is another promise. That's what Paul is saying. I promise you, your hope in God, you'll not be disappointed. But let me tell you something. Your house is in shambles. Don't blame God. You're out here living a, a catastrophe. Don't blame God. You pray to God and God says no, which is an answer. You may not like it, but don't blame God. I learned a long, long time ago that God knows more than I do. You're going to go, well, duh. And the truth of that is, that's one of the hardest lessons for us to fathom in our lives. Because it brings about submission. A lot of people don't like that. I don't want to submit my life. Well, listen to this. You know, the Word of God is very forthright, obviously. Real hope is not hope unless it stretches beyond the world's horizons. I believe that. Look what the Scripture says, 1 Corinthians 15, 17 through 19. And the Word of God tells us, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. That means not any good. And you are still in your sins. He says, listen. There are some like the Sadducees that don't believe in a resurrection. There are some that want to weed out the Word of God and take part of it, but not the totality of God's Word. There are some who believe they're wiser than God and know what's best for them more so than God does. There are some that are living a, a negative life. I'm not trying to be negative today. I'm trying to be on the positive side. Tell us we can have hope and a godly hope, and we don't have to worry about what the future holds if we're living according to the will and purpose of God. And so it tells us here, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Paul would say, Philippians 3 and verse 10, I want to know the power of the resurrection. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. 
You know what he's saying? Your hope must stretch beyond the world's horizons. Because of why? Why is it that we are to be pitied? Because your faith and hope exist without the conviction of who Jesus really is. And this is the shallow hope of those who claim they believe Jesus is the Son of God, but they do nothing about it. Oh, I believe in the Son of God, but nothing is done. So you ask the question, why are we to be pitied? Because of these very two facts. Isn't it great to be able to tell anyone on earth that true obedience to God's Word always gives hope? I believe that, church. I've had people talk to me about things. And they, uh, my father's a prime example. Father, Dad, why don't you ever come to hear me preach? And I kept waiting for him to say, because I've heard you can't. But he said, because if I walk into a church building, I believe the roof would collapse. I said, only in Malvern. No, I didn't say that. I said, no. Dad, listen to me. It would be better for you to be where God would have you to be and the roof to collapse. But you're hearing the truth of the Word of God with a chance to obey it. It would be better that that happened than to one day face God and the gates and the doors are closed forever. And you are without hope and without chance. Because, Dad, I promise you, only those who are obedient to the will and purpose of God are going to be those who are saved. Why do you think Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says, narrow is the way and few find it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many find it. Why is that there? Because it's true, right? Yes, son, I'm just not ready yet. Well, I've heard that over and over again. Well, when are you going to be ready? I don't know. Leave me alone. Yes, sir. Now, many of you know, baptized him six days before he died, but not after battling his stubborn will over many, many, many things, most of it guilt-ridden. Romans 8, 22-25. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. I mean, we yearn for it. That's what real Christianity does. That's what anticipation of the glory of Almighty God does. It's what want, wanting heaven does for all of us. For in this hope, watch this, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Hope is a conviction, church, of what God has said. Hope is knowing the truth of the Word of God. That if we conduct ourselves in a godly manner, people are going to notice. If we refuse to buckle under the pressure of what this world is trying to get us to do and what this world is trying to get us to accept. Have you ever noticed all these tolerant spewing people that behind their tolerance... It's something that is sinful. Have you noticed that? We need to be, be more tolerant. Bill wants to be Jane. Be tolerant of that. Jane wants to be Bill. Be tolerant of that. This person's lifestyle is ungodly. Be tolerant of that. And all, you know, all these things, and, and you find out <laughs> these same people wanting us to be tolerant are the last people on earth to be tolerant with Christianity. We, as children of God, we walk proudly under that banner, or we should. That banner, that placard, that we, we profess, I live for Jesus and for Jesus only. If the Word of God says, thou shall not, 
I'm not going to argue. That means I am not. And if it says thou shalt not condone this, it's an abomination before God. I don't have any power on the earth to make it right. None whatsoever. So I bow before God. If it causes you to be upset, Hollywood or liberal minds, whatever it happens to be, you're just going to have to be upset. But please be tolerant. So here we go. I can get on a roll today, I guarantee you that. Hebrews 11 and verse 1, watch this carefully. It's an off-quoted verse. Sometimes we miss the last part of its meaning. Hebrews 11 is what chapter? It's a faith chapter. Well, how so? Watch this. Now, faith is the, underline that word, assurance of things hoped for. Wow. My hope is about assurance. My faith is about assurance. I've said it many times. Hope and faith does not mean we sing blessed assurance with our fingers crossed. Can you imagine that? Blessed assurance. I started saying, you don't want to hear that, I'll guarantee you. Assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Notice what it says. This is what faith and hope are about. Assurance, conviction. Well, one other part of Scripture, and we're going to close today. I'll let you go a couple minutes early. It irks me to do so, but I will. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Wow. Wow. Isn't it wonderful to take the Word of God to be able to put Scripture together? Not to benefit or make it say what we want it to say, but to see the beauty within the pages of God's Word for what they actually do mean and say. Isn't that beautiful? Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? For he who promised is faithful. I love the fact I can tell the story of the gospel to anyone on this earth with boldness, with certainty, with conviction, and with absolute truth. Not because I'm saying it, but because God is. And many people are involved in atrocious things. Families get torn apart when it, problems can be resolved if people are willing to bow before Almighty God. Problems can be, be solved in our lives, but just like I told that man, God's not going to just come into our lives and invade our lives and make us do something against our will. We, if we're serious about Christianity, if we're serious about heaven, serious about our sins being taken away, church, we have to move toward Him. Each and every day. Maybe someone here today needs to respond, be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. That means have our sins taken away because that's where we contact the blood of Jesus. I believe one absolutely has to be baptized into Christ. It's absolutely necessary for salvation. Not because I said it, but because God did. If you have a need to repent, whatever it might be, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.